collectively, you're all a judge. Now let's meet the three who actually get to be our official judges. First, our chair, the endlessly touring, never boring, and the funny half of the double act presenting BBC Radio 4's The Infinite Monkey Cage, Robin Ince. <laughs> and his fellow judgelings are Manchester-based maths communicator and inventor of puzzles, Katie Steckles. I stress by that she invents puzzles. She didn't actually invent the puzzle as a, as a concept. And also senior lecturer in astrophysics at Imperial College London and author of Cosmology in Common Words book, The Edge of the Sky, Roberto Trotter. <laughs> so Robin, as a reminder to our audience and a vague check that you've paid some attention to your briefing, what are the criteria, what's the basis on which you're going to be attempting to pass judgment on these nine worthy champions? Well, what I'd like to see is I like what I would call a kind of an idea that's sticky, which means that after the three minutes, it has kind of stayed with me. And maybe even a day later when I'm wandering around and I suddenly see something, I might be looking at the sky, I might be looking at a tree, these ideas return to me. So I'm, I'm personally not necessarily looking for something which is just three minutes entirely there, sealed together. Here is a fact. It's the idea that the way that I look at the universe and the way they have educated me changes. Now, that opinion. is lovely, but if you're waiting for an idea that sticks with you a day later, there is a flaw in this as no, a no, process. No, no, but I will know because <laughs> I can already sense, you know, it's that ah. thing where, like reading a great, you know, we were talking before about Marcus Chown, wonderful yeah. uh, science writer, and you read one of his books and you immediately go, oh, they have now given me something, Marx has given me something which I know will remain with me. And that's, that right. to me is the most, that I like to hear things where I go, well, the universe just changed a little bit after I heard that. Okay, so you're setting Marcus Chan as a dauntingly high benchmark <laughs> for them to match up to. That seems only fair enough. Uh, Katie, these are, these are winners from all over the world. They've all got different levels of English. They've got different cultures. How on earth do you compare and contrast on a relatively level playing field? Well, science is an international language, right? So, you know, if it's interesting, it will still be interesting no matter who's talking about it. And if they communicate it well, then I will understand it well, I guess. Fair enough. And what are you particularly looking out for? Sticky, sticky ideas? Yeah, I think someone that I remember, someone that, that, you know, that makes an impression on me, but also interesting science. I think all of them are going to fit that basic minimum criteria. And Roberto Trotter, now your book, which I really, really love as well, it uses only the m thousand most common words to try and talk about everything in cosmology. That means no universe, no telescope. You can't even use the word scientist. So any late advice from our fame labbers on the right sort of words to use if you're trying to get science across to people? Well, there's going to be some fantastic science here, I'm sure, uh, but I hope it's not going to be jargon. Jargon is a, a, a killer for, for public engagement and communication. And so I hope that I'm going to get uh, people here talking about their science in an exciting uh, way that doesn't use any jargon, that takes complex ideas and makes them accessible, fun, entertaining, perhaps a new angle here and there. Uh, but most of, all, most of all, those should be ideas that are communicated in a way that everybody can understand. Okay, jargon-free, sticky, memorable, slight trace of Marcus Chan. No problem at all as well. Uh, I'd, like to now, I'd like to assure you that our judges have an infinite capacity for sagacity, but if their judgment was that good, would they have agreed to be here in the first place? Exactly. Right, now, history sprinted through, rules slightly fudged, judges half introduced, let's get on to seeing our first fame ladder in action. Order was based on the current FIFA rankings cross-indexed against internet speed and the number of Starbucks per square meter, and that means Israel go first. Now, for the sixth time in a row, the Israeli fame champion is a woman, no man has ever won, but what's different this year is that that woman is Avital Derry. Uh, a PhD student at the Wiseman Institute of Science, Avital delves into the fundamental makeup of the cosmos, including the recently discovered Higgs boson. When not doing that, she also manages to be an acclaimed classical singer performing across Israel and beyond. Particle physicist, professional musician, and Fame Lab champion, you can have it all if you're Avital Derry. Would you believe me if I told you that all the time, even just now as I speak, there's a flux of over a trillion particles per second going through your bodies? You can't see them, you can't feel them, because they're transparent, and we are transparent to them. Sounds kind of out there, right? I could just as easily have told you that there's a transparent unicorn here on stage with me. But the statement about the particles is a scientific statement, and I'm going to tell you about these extraordinary particles and what do they have to do with a case of champagne, the South Pole, and the edge of the universe? 
The, the first time anyone ever imagined that neutrinos existed was when a physicist named Pauli encountered a particle experiment that seemed to violate the conservation of energy. He then predicted that there is an invisible particle that takes away some of the energy with it. It seemed crazy. Pauli himself is quoted to have said, I have done a terrible thing. I've postulated a particle that cannot be detected. Pauli even bet a case of champagne that no one will ever be able to see it. It took 26 years, but Pauli lost his bet. In 1956, the neutrino was first observed in a Nobel Prize winning experiment. Today we know that neutrinos are elementary particles that only very rarely leave any trace. It's a probabilistic thing. It's as if they flip a coin where the odds of landing on heads and interacting are one in a billion trillion. Otherwise, they just pass through. This indifference of the neutrinos gives them a unique advantage. They travel at the speed of light, but unlike light, they can't be blocked. They just penetrate through any obstacle. This means they can provide us with a rare peek into faraway regions of the universe that we have no other way of seeing. Some of these neutrinos started their journey not long after the Big Bang and are arriving here today. The challenge is to be able to see them. In order to fight the odds, we would need a huge detector. And here some creative scientists came and said, we don't need to build something humongous, we can use something that already exists, the ice of the South Pole. Today, one of the leading experiments in the field is a neutrino observatory in the South Pole called Ice Cube. They use a volume of a kilometer cubed in the ice and measure the response of the ice to the neutrinos that pass through. Ice Cube is uh, accumulating data now. Details of new neutrinos every year, some of which have come from the edge of the universe. They've traveled for nearly 14 billion years through faraway galaxies just to leave an imprint in our Antarctica today. In the future, the data that will accumulate is bound to shed light on some of the mysteries of the universe using the invisible particles that are rushing through us. Thank you. <laughs> <coughs> So thank you. Nice to see the word humongous worked in there somewhere along the way. <laughs> and now prepare to be bombarded by a particle array of questions from our judges. Can you tell us a little bit more about uh, what those neutrinos from the edge of the universe can, uh, can tell us about what's going on there? Okay, so these neutrinos, they have uh, a few astrophysical sources. And these are sources that we, we don't know quite, quite a lot about. Some of them are called uh, gamma ray bursts starburst galaxies and active galactic nuclei. Gamma ray burst, for example, is just is a name for something we don't really understand. We just call it gamma ray burst because that's what we see, a burst of gamma rays. And hopefully the neutrinos that are emitted in this process can help us understand it better. Another thing is the neutrinos themselves are still a mystery in some ways. We know that they have mass because of a phenomena called neutrino oscillation, but the current um, model of particle physics does not allow for neutrino masses. So we know that there's something other than the standard model of particle physics out there, and this may give us a clue to what, it, what that is. Can I ask you if, the, I, I think it's, <coughs> it's a, always a remarkable achievement to, to be that concise, three minutes, and uh, what was, when you're putting that together, what is the fact that, or the idea that you had to remove? What for you was the one thing that was the hardest thing to actually sacrifice? You mean things that I had to take to out to of to it? To get it into three minutes, yes. Yes, I, I, I wanted to talk more about, uh, <coughs> about the idea that came from an experiment that did not, didn't make sense. Just it didn't, uh, it didn't obey the, the law of conservation of energy. And, and that's why Pauli realized that there's something there that we don't understand and invented the neutrino, which then was found. But I, I realized that talking about laws of physics and that's a little too much for three minutes, and I hope it, it, it was clear enough. Um, I was just wondering, what's your research? Are you rese researching specific things to do with this? I'm currently, my research is, has more to do with the Higgs boson than neutrinos, but I have done some work on neutrinos. And my group works closely with uh, people in the Ice Cube collaboration, and we're really looking forward to seeing what the new data will bring. Brilliant, thank you. Thank Abital Deary, by the way. And Abital Deary is an anagram of very detail, which I think is generally a good idea. She also told me that although her surname is Deary, uh, she's actually vegan. 
Uh, now, from Israel, we go straight to Egypt, uh, not normally the easiest thing to do. Uh, there's now been a FameLab Egypt competition for the last six years, and even though quite a lot has changed there during that time, uh, and their 2015 champion is Dina al Magrabi. Now, after getting an MA in immunology, she's now studying to be a medical doctor, uh, no jokes about chiropractors, please, and is one of exactly 4,847 scientists, according to a suspiciously precise Wikipedia entry, who work at Egypt's National Research Center. When not with her 4,846 colleagues, uh, Dina likes cooking, reading, doing crosswords, and traveling. Uh, winning Fame Lab has, of course, helped with the last one, bringing her all the way to Cheltenham. But can she now just go a little bit further and get to the international final? It all hinges on the next three minutes with our Egyptian champion, Dina Al Magrabi. <laughs> Last July, I was attending Adam's birthday party. Adam and all the other children were running and playing, enjoying their birthday cake and the other sweets. All except little Lily, whose mother had to be watching her all the time. And it's not because Lily's mother was overprotective. It was because Lily had diabetes ever since she was three months old. A type of diabetes termed neonatal diabetes that presents within the first six months of life. When those children were first encountered, they were by default prescribed insulin. Yet, noticeably, many of them did not respond well. And this raised the question, why? To be able to understand that, let's take a step back and look at some physiology. When you eat something, your blood glucose level rises. It then enters the beta cell of the pancreas, which is the cell responsible for synthesis, storage, and release of insulin hormone that controls your blood sugar level. On the surface of the beta cell, there is a potassium channel, which is always open and a calcium channel, which is always closed. When glucose enters via the glucose transporter too, it gets metabolized, giving high amounts of ATP, which is the source of energy for the body cells. This ATP closes the potassium channel, leading to changes in the membrane potential that ultimately open the calcium channel, leading to gush of calcium ions inside the cell that push the insulin vesicles outside to the blood. Now, um, the problem with these children is that they have no problem synthesizing insulin like other diabetic patients, but they have a problem with this potassium channel that lost, it lost its sensitivity for ATP and remains open all the time. And still remained the question why. And after years of research, the, mis the mystery was unraveled. It turned out that those children have a mutation in the KCNJ11 gene on chromosome 11. That encodes parts of this potassium channel. Up to date, more than 30 mutations have been discovered giving rise to a spectrum that ranges from neonatal diabetes up to the severest form, which is Den syndrome, that is developmental delay with epilepsy and neonatal diabetes. Yet the answer to the first question led to a second question, and that is how to treat those children. And amazingly, they turned out responsive to oral hypoglycemics, which tend to regain the function of the channel, control the blood sugar very well, and improve their developmental delay. Lily had her blood sample withdrawn and gene sequencing was performed. Lily turned out positive for a mutation in the KCNJ11 gene. Lily has been shifted from insulin to oral hypoglycemics. Lily no longer needs to take insulin shots and can now take her medication in her juice or her milk. And the most important thing is that Lily's blood control is now perfectly uh, and amazingly controlled. And moreover, Lily and her mother owing to that discovery, can now go to Adam's birthday party and enjoy the birthday cake this year and every other year. Thank you very much. Right, that was telling us how diabetes can be diabetes, so we can let them eat cake. I think the panel might want to know a bit more about the beating of it. Yeah, um, how common is this? Is it quite a rare mutation? Um, it occurs on the order of um, one in um, 300,000. Why, why did you choose this subject? What is it particularly that excites you about sharing this idea? Um, for more than one thing, basically, um, if you discover this, that this is the cause of diabetes in, this chil in these children, you kind of change their whole quality of life. You change uh, them from taking insulin injections to a very easy medication that is available, uh, cheap, and very easily administered. 
the comments that you heard, the, that you can hear from the children and their parents is that the children are now playing freely. They can now sleep over with their friends. They can now go to school because they don't need somebody to be giving them the insulin injections when they're that young. And this is really very effective when you read us. It's very touching from the parents and from the children themselves. And there was once a, a, um, a girl commenting that um, she said, I can now wear a dress. And she, I was asked why. And she said, because I no longer need to wear an insulin pump around my tummy. Is, is there other possible applications of this technology in the future? This kind of technique? Of the technique, you yeah. mean the sequencing or yeah. regarding the KT and J11 especially? The, the, the sequencing technique ap applied to finding out about this, can it be used for to do some other checks in the future? Uh, it is being used because other genes have now been implicated, like the ABCC8 gene, which is a less common cause of neonatal diabetes, but it is now being implicated as another cause. Um, and so now um, it is being done like a routine. If a child presents with diabetes within the first six months of life, and it has sometimes been extended to the, extended to the first year of life, that uh, these children would get the gene sequencing which can be done. And I think it's being done for free here in the UK. Brilliant. Our Egyptian champion, Dina El Maghrabi. Thank you, Dina. Since Dina is a crossword fan, she may already know that her name is an anagram of I'm Algebra Handy. Now, uh, third in our random order, and it was just random, we have our new Fame Lab Germany champion, Dong Sung Chang. Now, you're right, that's not a traditional German name. Dong Sun's parents met in Germany, but they are Korean, one from the north, one from the south. That makes him, in his own words, a child of peace and love, who's mostly grown up in Germany, partly in Korea, and a bit in the USA. Dongston says all this swapping and hopping between different countries and different cultures got him interested in how people interact, and more specifically, how social behavior is represented in our brains. And that, in turn, has led to him being a PhD student in social neuroscience at the Max Planck Institute for Biological Cybernetics in Tübingen. Now, he says it may also explain why he likes sharing science with others through Fame Lab. Now, get ready for peace, love, and understanding from our 2015 Fame Lab Germany winner, Dong Sun Chang. My take over our future world. So, I want to start with the question what makes the biggest difference between a computer, a robot, or a human brain? I want to give you two examples. The first one regards faces. So if you take, for example, a computer or robot with its amazing sensor to China or to, to Korea or to Japan and ask whether it can distinguish different people, then probably it would. It's a Chinese, Japanese, at least they're different people. If I take the three members from the jury right now to East Asia, to Korea, and say, can you distinguish them? They might probably say, they look very similar to me. <laughs> and the reason is because the brain specializes on things which you have more experience with, and also for people you have more experience with. That's the first reason. The second thing is an example of our color. If you look at my shirt, it is red. Red has two descriptions. The first would be 700 nanometers. It's a frequency of light. It's a physical information. It's the spectrum of light. And if you would ask computers or robots, they would code the exact physical information of that color. But if you ask people and give them the exact same picture of a color, they cannot agree on it. Maybe you have seen the dress. Who has thought this is blue-black? Did some of you thought this is white gold? Right, this is one picture, the same color, but people see different colors in it. And the question is, why do people do that? It has to do with our brains. Our brains code the information in a most efficient way, which means, depending on the context and the environment, it takes certain assumptions what color would that be which you see? So you see, compared to humans and robots, we humans are much more flexible and efficient in coding the information from the outside world. I study this not only with color or faces, but with actions, because if you take gestures or actions, they are different in every different country. Especially in Italy, there are many gestures, and maybe only Italians understand it, but in other parts of the world, people might think differently. In Bulgaria, for example, this is yes, this is no. So this is why I'm interested in studies, the different information you get from human actions or faces cross culturally And last finishing question is, why is it important? The reason is we often think or expect 
that we humans should see the world all in a different way, having same opinions, same expectations. But research shows, and it is fact, that every human perceives the world in its own unique way. And I would argue that's what makes us humans special compared to computers or robots. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, I was assuming that was Dong Sun Chang, but now I'm not so sure. Uh, <laughs> judges, you may have to interrogate him yeah, to find out. Maybe you think you know me, you have a similar Asian friend, but yeah. <laughs> I mean, this is, this is really interesting stuff, and I find this kind of stuff really interesting. So do you find that, you know, when you're interacting with people, do you realize things about the way that you're perceiving things, and does it affect the way that you behave around people, the fact that you're researching this? Uh, right. I mean, the research helps me for observing other people, and I always have my theory. Actually, if you let me go to the finals, the talk would be about how what I perceive from other people changes the perception of my world. And actually, it's an interaction always between different people, which makes it more interesting. Do you think we should be a, a sparring in terms of uh, the creation of artificial intelligence to reach that point uh, to create machines which would have the same human ability, or do you think it's best that we always keep the edge we have? I think uh, part of it, I mean, it's a definitely important question about artificial intelligence, how it can evolve, it's important to think about, but I think at the current state, if you study it, we are not that far yet, we are very, very far away. So. For example, deep learning, what um, Google or many computer machine learning algorithm implement, you kind of try to reach a performance by something you don't completely understand, the human brain, with something, an algorithm, you also don't completely understand. So maybe there is a danger, but I think in principle we don't understand so much, we are not that far, not even with artificial intelligence. So it's probably a little bit of the fear of the unknown because you don't really understand how the computer works. What kind of technology would you need or what kind of algorithm is most promising in order to be able to even beat the capacity of the human brain for recognizing different clues? For example, social behavior, very difficult for machines. Yeah. So about the algorithms, because I'm a probably very bad programmer compared to my colleagues at my institute, I cannot really give you the right answer. But what we do in regard to that is first understanding human social behavior. So we record different actions. We give a lot of different, we, we uh, record a lot of different information how humans interact, which is already very difficult because uh, we all change our behavior depending on with whom we interact. So that's why we, for example, take avatars and emotions, and then we try to understand how humans solve this problem of interaction, and then we can model it um, with computer models whether this kind of expectations humans automatically have about others can be also simulated with programs. Okay, change your behavior now from watching to clapping for Dong Thank Sun you. Chang. <laughs> that way. <laughs> so he was good, certainly in the top three so far, but will he be there when we've had the other two-thirds of our semi-finalists? Only time will tell. Now, next, in a brief outbreak of random alphabetical order, we move from Germany to Greece and the new Greek peak in fame library that is Anastasia Draha. Now, Anastasia is an undergraduate studying electrical engineering and computing at the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki, but you have to wonder how long she actually spends there, because as well as her studies, she's also been an active member of the European Youth Parliament, participated in debates and conferences across Europe modelled on the United Nations, that sounds fun, sung in a rock blues band and still found time to take part in and win Fame Lab Greece. Then there's the tennis, there's the books that Anastasia is writing, the science festival she's helping organise, the environmental projects she volunteers for. She clearly makes every second count. So enjoy 180 of them shared with Anastasia Draha. So the most amazing thing I can share with you about the universe is the fact that every atom on planet Earth, every atom on our human body, is originated from the sole factories in nature responsible for the creation of chemical elements, the stars. Imagine stars of huge mass, eight times bigger than our sun, full of hydrogen. According to the laws of physics, in places with large mass accumulation, gravity is stronger and acts as a mechanism of compression. Therefore, the outer layers of mass are putting so much pressure at the core, at the hydrogen in the core, at such a degree that the star, in order to maintain its delicate balance, has to find a way to beat this outer pressure with some inner energy. The source of this energy comes from a very specific procedure. 
four hydrogen atoms come so close together that they merge, or as scientists say, fuse, to create a new element, four times heavier, called helium. During this fusion, there is some energy production that resists against the outer pressure, and our, our star can survive. But what happens is that when hydrogen is all run out and we have helium, then helium starts to fuse into even heavier elements, like carbon. And the core is constantly transformed into even heavier and heavier elements under extreme pressure and temperature conditions until it is completely made out of iron. Iron is a very strong and rigid chemical element that doesn't withstand any transformation and doesn't release any energy during its fusion and therefore makes our stars kind of unstable. Suddenly, the iron core of the star collapses and our star is led to total destruction in the form of a magnificent luminous stellar explosion named supernova. The enriched with chemical elements guts of the dead stars are now dispersed in the galaxies, ready to form new stars, new planets, ready to build life. Let's take now the body of a person around 70 kilos. It is comprised of about 7,000 trillions of trillions of atoms. That's seven with 27 zeros afterwards, massive number. 67% of those atoms are hydrogen atoms, the element that was created alongside the universe 13.8 billion years ago. So that basically means that two thirds of the atoms in our body have the age of the universe let alone the fact that the other 90 chemical elements were born in fatal star explosions. How fascinating is that for our own existence? A great astrophysicist once said that people are the means for the universe to better understand itself. And I think this is our best description, as the universe isn't just around us, but the universe is literally inside us. So next time you look upon the starry night sky, don't feel small and insignificant, but rather feel yourself as a part of this stellar ocean. Because in a sort of poetic way, we are all made of stardust, and one day we'll return to the stars. Thank you. Two thirds of atoms as old as in our bodies as old as the universe. You know, I have days when it feels more like three quarters. <laughs> yeah, uh, panel. Uh, what, what do you think this, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, the, let me start over. What do you think the uh, origins of the supernovae can tell us about uh, the universe? Can we use the supernovae to learn something about the universe itself? Yeah, sure. So at the beginning, um, the stars, before the stars existed, there was like um, a big cloud of gas and dust. And uh, because of their own gravity, they used to collapse and fall on themselves, and the core became to more denser and more hotter, and uh, the star, into its, its own fusion, had a, like a light switch on, and then it started um, to exist. So basically, when we have this accumulation of chemical elements that are created in the core uh, of the star, like our star is a crucible that creates all these chemical elements um, that will forge life, if we then see them dispersed in the galaxies, we can really find information about how the stars were at the beginning and uh, um, tell us more about ourselves and the universe itself also. Do you remember your first reaction when you found out that idea that you know, that, that number of atoms inside you were in fact as, as old as the universe? Yes, um, at first I thought it would be like, we were so selfish to consider ourselves as a part, as like the center of the universe, but belonging to something so greater and being actually a part of it gave me that feeling that, you know, nobody is alone in this world. As long as you have like bits and parts of the universe inside you, this means that you belong uh, to something greater with more people. And that gave me like the satisfaction that, you know, whatever happens in life, you still know that you are a part of something greater than you. Um, I mean, again, I'm just interested to know what your, what your research is about. Well, I have nothing to do with astrophysics. I'm studying electrical engineering and computer science. I'm on my first year, so I'm just learning general things. But um, astrophysics is kind of my passion, and especially like this topic. And Blues Rock and the European <laughs> Parliament and a few <laughs> other things as well. One more time, please. Stella, as she was, Anastasia Draha. So that was our Greek bearing giftedness, and we move on to our man in the middle, the fifth of nine semi-finalists, who in his own words is a data magician, Simon Drobniak, winner of Famelab Poland 2015. 
Now, Simon's an evolutionary biologist whose work involves sifting through lots of complex data and finding patterns and pieces that are significant among it. He says that although evolution is cool, some of his colleagues think it's impossible to talk about accurately without using mathematical con uh, concepts, which puts off the general public. Simon disagrees and entered FameLab to help find ways for his communication about evolution to evolve. Clearly they have, and after topping the Polish poll, he's here to find out about how well adapted he is to survive the international semi-final. There can be lots of Darwinians, but there can be only one Darwinner. Will it be Simon Drobniak? likely to destroy an idealistic view of biology many, many of you uh, have, because I'm going to tell you a story of the biggest biological sex scandal of all time. I think I'd like to start by asking you to picture some tits. I mean, blue tits, like uh, blue yellow birds, uh, along with other pastorines, tits have long been considered perfect parents, uh, devoted to raising their kids, hardworking, um, and monogamous. And then molecular genetics entered field biology, changing everything. It turned out that in over 90% of all bird species, including monogamic ones, females cheat on their husbands, seeking additional copulation. The motivation of uh, females is simple. The female wants to mate with the sexiest male in the hope that his sexiness signals good genes that can provide her offspring with a better chance of succeeding in life. Uh, in a population, many males are far from these super sexy individuals. Actually, the majority of them are average or even of inferior quality and way below any expectation. Uh, the urge to reproduce is unstoppable, so some females just have to accept mating with these inferior bearers of low quality genes. Uh, and the female can't just pick the bad genes out of her offspring, uh, but she can at least try to replace them with a better version. Uh, it may seem that the benefits of such a quick bit on the side are slightly negligible because after all, these are just slightly better genes and only in a fraction of the offspring. And the female also risks being uh, abandoned if her actual partner realizes that he's been cuckolded. Uh, however, not only do females uh, engage in these so-called extra per copulations, but they also do something even more remarkable. Calculating what pays off the most, uh, females manipulate the sex of the offspring to sire more sons among the offspring of these extra pair super sexy individuals, uh, hoping that these sons will inherit their father's sexiness and with this increased propensity of attracting multiple uh, females. In other words, sexy partners on the side sire sexy sons, which in turn reproduce more efficiently and attract, uh, sorry, and spread mom's genes more effectively. Uh, does it mean that cheating is evolutionarily programmed also in humans? Well, not really, and this is probably a good news for many divorce lawyers. Uh, we have to remember that humans have for some time escaped the pressure of biological evolution, and our current decisions and behaviors are shaped less by biology and more by ethics and what we call cultural evolution. So we may be apes, but very cultural ones, so Let's not blame all of our indiscretions and instincts. I'm sure that Charles Darwin wouldn't mind at all. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Just before I hand it, I just, just checked, did you choose the subject of female promiscuity based on personal bitterness? No. <laughs> okay, fine. But some people <laughs> tend to think Okay, like just this. checking. <laughs> Can I ask you, when, when you're talking about uh, that behaviour such that, what, what have you found is the most problematic with people who wish to re reject the idea of evolution, do you find that a story such as that actually helps show uh, evolution in action and indeed the fact that it is around us all the time? Yes, I, I think it may help because I think these kinds of behaviours really show that there is a really complex process that underlies all these uh, uh, evolutionary changes. And also, I think an important thing is to tell people that all these things I've been talking about are not a conscious decisions. And once they realize they are not conscious, they appreciate that, they, that there has to be some process that leads to the evolution of such a remarkable and complex uh, pattern. I'm interested to know, can or how can the male birds tell if it's someone else's offspring? Uh, w w sorry? If, if, um, if the, the female has been cheating, can the male tell? Like, how can he find out? 
Ah, yeah. Um, usually the female, like in birds, female is the sex that initiates cheating. So she has to fly away from the nest and she seeks additional partners. And uh, so, so the, the actual partner can know that he's been uh, scolded only if he actually sees the female copulating with another male. So otherwise, he That's probably, yeah, he, yeah. He, <laughs> he, he, raises, he raises the kids that are not his usually. And in some species, this is even 100% of the whole clutch. So the male may be raising the kids that are entirely not his. This might sound a little bit voyeuristic, but how can you tell experimentally that this is what's happening? How do you so how, so do you how, to, so how to detect cheating? Yeah. Yeah. How so do we know? Yeah, yeah. So this this is very easy. Actually, divorce lawyers also know the know the, the know the trick because you have to use genetic tools. Uh, if we have genetic material from uh, the female and from her actual partner, like the social partner, and the DNA is from the from the offspring. We can see which offspring actually uh, cannot be assigned to the to the male, and it's likely to be sired by an extra pair partner. Okay, be cheeky on the others. Give you more time. Can we think one more time, please? Thanks, Simon Drobniak. And Simon, I, I know also happen to know Carrie ca cares for a small family of carnivorous plants. I say this not so much as a biographical detail as a warning to the other semi-finalists. Now, for the first time this year, we've had a FameLab Vietnam, and our inaugural winner is Viet Vu, a fourth-year computer science student at the National University in Hanoi. Now, Viet is a lot of fun to follow on Twitter, at Robber Viet, although he never even mentions entering or winning FameLab. He tweets things like, what is tragedy? It's when you have a thesis to submit next week and have no intention to do it. And new term, shrimp girl, the girl you will eat the body, not the head. Uh, now, we're not tweeting or avoiding submitting his thesis. Viet says he's on the lookout for the extraordinary, even in the ordinary. And he wants to tell people how science is amazing and part of absolutely everything. So, now's his chance. A big Cheltenham hand for our Vietnam champion, Viet Vu. Well, the first thing that I expect to see in England is the rain. And actually, I did. And luckily, I bought this. Well, actually, I love the rain because the rain is wet, it's fresh, and it's cool. Sometimes it can be sad, but it's absolutely romantic holding your hand in a girlfriend and walking down the rain. And there is something more about the rain and I'm curious about, and I believe many of you have experienced this before. Have you ever smelled the earthy smell, the ground smell in, that in the rain? Yes, you do, right? But what about what is this smell and how could it come from our nose? Actually, this smell has been explained by research in 1964 by an Australian scientist. So this smell caused by some bacteria and oil of the plant inside the ground. And it, it comes to our nose and makes us smell. But what is the mechanism behind it? What caused this oil and bacteria come to our nose? Actually, this research very recently, in 2015, January, has explained this. Two scientists in MIT has do some tests on this. So first, you need a camera, a really fast one, can cause thing at a very high speed and very small. At that, with that camera, we we'll see a droplet of the rain is this big, and when it hit the ground, it is this slow. So thing is, when the droplet it hit the ground, it is flatten out. It form a layer of water, and with some kind of surface, especially when it's porous, it means it has some hole in it so the air and the food can go through it. Well, because there is some air be under the ground, so when the layer of water has an out, it forms some tiny bubble be under it. So this bubble goes through the layer of water and bursting out at the first surface. And this causes some aerosol inside the ground, bursting into the atmosphere. So this aerosol carry out the bacteria and the oil, and this forms a tiny cloud and, uh, above the droplet. Uh, and this cloud will be spread out by the wind, by the breeze into our nose. So what's so interesting about this research? Well, you see, uh, the nature of the, the smell has been explained in 1964. But 50 years later, another research has explained its mechanism. So why taking so long? Well, maybe because people see the rain as it's so ordinary thing that they ignore it. But there's always something extraordinary in the ordinary thing. And if you use science, you can connect it. Thank you.
That was our reigning champion from Vietnam, Viet Vu, <laughs> judges away. I'm impressed by his rascalism to come on stage with an umbrella, <laughs> up, even though we know it's bad <laughs> luck. Yeah. Uh, and I, I wondered, wh why did you want to uh, talk about that idea, say, as opposed to something which might be more related to uh, your study of computer science? Oh, yes. Uh, although I'm studying computer science, but I found this research very interesting and uh, because Oh, well, uh, as I said before, this research, the smell, it has been explained in 1954. But uh, even the scientists, they do not realize and they do not know what is the mechanism. And only 50 years later, they find, they study it, and they find it. Well, uh, so it means there is always something uh, can be learned some ab about around us, even in the things that are so ordinary like the rain. And if you apply science to it, you can learn something more about it. So that's the message. Do you find that uh, taking the hard glare of science and, and put this beam onto something poetic, poetic such as that, this destroys the poi uh, poetry, or vice versa? Well, uh, uh, can you repeat? Sorry, I'm, I'm, uh, you take science, the hard science, yes. very cold and factual, yes. and you look at something poetic like the rain with the, with the, with the glasses of science. Does yes. it destroy the poetry for you? Uh, yes, uh, to me it's, it's very interesting because many people take science maybe something so hard that it will take many years to study. And uh, it must be something about uh, maybe launching a rocket or curing cancer. But it, it, it could lie in something so ordinary. So that's what's uh, so interesting about it. I, I really love kind of when you find bits of science in the world around you like that. Um, I mean, were there any other topics that you considered talking about like similar to that? Uh, um, maybe um, because there is so many things around us. Uh, maybe even in the water, water maybe in, in this very ground. Always something to find and talk about, yeah, about science. Okay, well, if he comes back to the final, maybe you'll find something else to talk about. Yes, Our Vietnamese you. champion, Viet Vu. <laughs> Only six letters in Viet Vu. That is the shortest name in the history of Fame Lab, although obviously that by itself will not get him into the final. Uh, now, for reasons of randomness, the last three semi finalists are all from countries beginning with C. Uh, the first of those is our Czech champ, Ondra Leditsky. Uh, Ondra's hobbies include photography, playing guitar, and acro yoga, which I was disappointed to find. It did not mean doing acrostic puzzles while doing bending your body into strange shape, but actually acrobatics and yoga. Uh, Ondra's life motto is, the bigger our dreams, the bigger our world is. And what he dreams of is being a writer. While he waits for that to be fulfilled, he says he's getting lots of literary ideas by working on his PhD in biopolymers at the Institute of Macromolecular Chemistry in Prague, and by being the hero in his own Fame Lab adventure story and getting all the way to the final chapter in Cheltenham. Will he make it to the international final, or will there be one more twist in the tale? Writing his own destiny, it's Andre Leditsky. I've got a package here for Mr. Schumer. Is he sitting somewhere here? You may have seen him. You may have seen him. He's quite aggressive. Well, imagine for a moment that all of you are one organism. Some of you are heart cells, some of you are liver cells, and some of you are brain cells. And I have to deliver this package to Mr. Schumer, who's sitting somewhere among you. Standard delivery in these days look like this. I have a drug I need to deliver. And classic chemotherapy has this kind of effect. And it hopes it will stumble upon Mr. Tumor, who's sitting over there in the eighth row. As you see, it's quite ineffective. A lot of mail is lost along its way. And that is why we are trying to develop a system which would be able to give this package in one piece to the right direction. What is my role in all of this? Each cell in your body has its unique postcode, just like a real places in life do. If I mark this package, GL50 1QA, it will be delivered in a people in Chelton Town Hall. Now, if I want to deliver this package, box with drugs, to aggressive B lymphoma cells, I have to mark it with pulse code CD20. And that's simply what I'm doing in the lab. 
I have the box. I've got the postcode. Two years of hard work. <laughs> and by the way, developing this box has taken our team over 30 years. Well, what happens next? The box is delivered to Mr. Tumor Cells. The drug is released. And now it makes its way to the cell's DNA. And what happens when the drug reaches the cell's DNA? They break it. And breaking cell's DNA is like a breaking somebody's heart, which in this case leads to the cell suicide. And that is why I'm working for drug delivery system, DDS. I don't want the innocent cells committing suicide just because of receiving a wrong mail. This package is exclusively for Mr. Tumor. Thank you. I find that slightly disturbing because I get a lot of the neighbor's mail like this, so I hope it doesn't, <laughs> doesn't work out for me. Uh, panel? Can you tell us a bit more about how exactly you want to deliver those packages in your work? What does it involve? Um, what every aspect of the packages are necessary to be taken care about, you mean? Uh, how, do you, how does your work help in delivering the package to the right place in the body? How do you do it? Okay, there's a, like a, imagine there's a surface on the cells which attract certain molecules. In this case, the CD20 is like an antibody which reacts in the surface marker of the cell called um, CD20. So the antibody reacts with the surface marker and stick together. I, I was going to ask uh, whether, when you were approaching this as an idea, were you approaching it firstly because you thought, I can create this something theatrical, or was your initial point, this is an idea, now what can I do with it? <laughs> well, this is my work, and <laughs> drug delivery system is actually what we are using, so that's why I picked up uh, the, it's like connecting with D DHL to make clearly what we are doing in the lab. And do you think you would always, work whenever, I mean, obviously, you know, if you do very well on this, then you may well end up dealing with lots of other subjects. Do you think you'll always be looking at how can you create something that is a piece of theatre as well as a scientific idea? <sighs> yeah, I, I like theatre. I like to connect both things together. And I like doing stupid ideas. So, <laughs> like a connecting theatre and science is quite tricky because you have to be stupid and smart in the same time. <laughs> <laughs> That's the, that's, that's the acting profession, Tom. <laughs> so if we, see you, if we see you again in the final, can we be guaranteed a new costume? Uh, new show. New show? New, new stupidity. <laughs> new stupidity. Okay, yeah. there, is no, there is no higher recommendation for that. Please, one more time for Andra Lidicti. Right, on to our penultimate semi-finalist, our 26th of the day, and it's one of our curveballs, the winner of FameLab CERN. As I'm hoping most of you, actually know all of you, probably are aware, CERN is not yet an independent country. It is the research organization that one runs the world's largest particle physics lab, and it's in a suburb of Geneva right on the border of France and Switzerland. France and Switzerland, two countries that have their own Fame Labs. In fact, the masterclass for FameLab is a joint one in CERN. So you'd think CERN would have had enough, but no, 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 no. It's CERN's 60th anniversary, and they got so excited, they decided to have a special CERN celebration by having their very own FameLab. It's precisely how I plan to mark my own 60th. Um, and then even more than that, they thought, it's so good, we've got through to the semi-finals at Cheltenham with, with somebody. You know what? that's the day to kick the Large Hadron Collider up to speed as well. So they've really gone big for us on this one. Uh, the competition was only open to CERN employees, researchers working there, and exotic subatomic particles. And although an Omega sub B baryon was one of the runners up, uh, the winner was Norwegian researcher Lillian uh, Smiester. Uh, Lillian Smiester, anagram of in small details, and a particle physicist, she knows it's the very small details that can make all the difference. 
We're not searching for dark matter or studying antimatter. She paints, knits, mountain bikes, plays trumpet, does yoga, and keeps snails as pets. Warning, CERN is very close to France. <laughs> and Lillian Smeister, also anagram of small snail diet. Uh, Lillian says that sharing the joy and wonder of, of nature connects us, which is something we sorely need in the world of today. So, Large Hadron Collide, your hands together for the caring, sharing CERN champion, Lillian Smiesta. Would you agree with me that it's easier to move forward on two feet rather than on one foot? I'll take a step back and tell you how this applies to the field of my expertise and the passion of mine, the physics of particles. In this field, we will find two somewhat opposing parties. We have the experimental particle physicists and the theoretical particle physicists. Experimentalists, as you might guess, perform experiments. They get up and do measurements in order to see how nature really works. Theoreticians, on the other hand, sit down and calculate to see how nature might work. They dream up new physics beyond what we already know. In general, experimentalists benefit from theoreticians via their suggestions on what to look for and models to explain their data. Theoreticians benefit from experimentalists, keeping their feet on the ground in this world, making sure they're connected with the reality they want to describe. So you can see there's a mutual beneficial relationship going on here, but as in many relationships, the communication isn't always great. They have the capacity to surprise each other, and one might be ahead of the other. Take the discovery of the muon, a heavier version of the electron, which we know and love from electricity. Experimentalists met this discovery with ecstasy. Look, we found a whole new building block of nature. Theoreticians, not so much. Their surprise dismay was most famously vocalized by one whom, upon hearing the news, said, who ordered that? For the past decades, theoreticians have been miles ahead of experimentalists. It took about half a century from the Higgs mechanism was formulated until the Higgs particle finally was found as announced at CERN the 4th of July, 2012. A truly unforgettable day of my life. I hope I've convinced you that physics move forward on two feet. The work of experimentalists and the work of theoreticians. CERN's large particle collider is starting up more powerful than ever just these days. And as you've heard, I'm not kidding you, it happened today. It will be truly exciting to see which of the models that theoreticians have dreamed up will be what experimentalists find in reality. So stay tuned as we peer deeper into nature than ever before. Okay, Lynn, it may have been a coincidence they started up today, but I thought I'd big you up a bit by saying Thank it was you. all down to you. And, you know, why not? <laughs> um, so, I mean, I'm a pure mathematician, so you can obviously guess which side I'm on, but are you an experimentalist or a theoretician? Right. I'm glad that you didn't understand that from my talk, because <laughs> I tried to be somewhere in the middle. Uh, I'm an experimentalist, but um, it took quite a while for me to understand this relationship, because... By heart, I'm more a theoretician. So, so that's why I find this relationship intriguing. The playing field perhaps a little bit skewed against uh, the experimentalists. It takes so long to build those big machines. It's so cheap to just sit up with a, p a bit of pa pen and paper and just write down some new Lagrangian. You know? Yeah, well, uh, I think there's quite some hard work going down into figuring out whether that Lagrangian works. Uh, but yeah, lately it's not that easy anymore to be an experimentalist in this field because it takes forever to build that ma those machines. Um, but uh, it's a lot of fun on that side too. So. Why do you believe that uh, non-scientists should or need to know about the workings of 21st century physics? Why? Yeah. Why, why, why do you want to share those ideas? Because there are people who just go, well, it means yeah. nothing to me. I've got my mobile phone, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Oh, 
because society, I mean, depends on these ideas. Fundamental physics have proven time upon time to be what really brings our human society forward. Like you wouldn't have the cell phone without this fundamental science. And I think people need to know that because it links directly to our curiosity and curiosity is very human. So if you can bring this uh, technological world that might scare people off to the people, I think, I think it will, <laughs> it sounds a bit cheesy, but I think it will help the world be a more peaceful place. Oh, she's based in Switzerland. She said cheesy at the end. You can't do better than that. Okay. <laughs> Lillian Sviesta, thank you. And one more anagram of Lillian Sviesta because there are loads aliens still mad. Right, and that brings us to our final semi-finalist. And given the old British saying that everything stops for tea, I thought it was great that we were going to be stopping with the FameLab Croatia winner, T. Rikovina. Then I discussed, spoke to her and found out that although it's spelt T-E-A, it's pronounced Taya, rhymes with surveyor and volleyball player, which is also good because she's a civil engineer and a volleyball player and a poet. Taya says she loves concrete, steel and poetry, although I didn't check whether that means she loves concrete poetry. Has two books of her poems published. Being a poet and a scientist means there's no rhyme or reason not to give a huge oration, ovation to our Croatian, Taya Rukovina. Can you believe that a structure made of steel can behave just like a piece of paper? It can, and you have to trust me because I'm an engineer. And now I'm going to take you on a journey to witness the battle of the titans in which the main characters are a bridge and the wind. Who will be the winner of this epic struggle? Let's go back to the year 1940 to the USA, the bridge Tacoma Narrows, also known by its pet name, Galloping Dirty, is actually galloping furiously at a wind speed of only 60 kilometers per hour. Why did this bridge collapse if it was supposed to endure wind speeds of up to 160 kilometers per hour? Many people think that this was due to resonance, but this is not true. And now, 75 years after this tragedy, you can still find this misinformation in many physics books. Okay, for resonance, you must have a periodic force whose frequency matches the natural frequency of the structure. That's why jumping on a bridge with your friends is not such a great idea. But on this location, the wind was not periodic, but constant. So we have to find another cause. The real reason for the collapse was a phenomenon known as flutter. We can simulate it now with this piece of paper as the model of a bridge. So when I pull this paper tight and blow across it, it will start to flutter. And then the, as the wind blows in more and more energy, the movements will increase. And when the material cannot endure the stress anymore, the structure will collapse. Another thing happened here. Two vibrational modes of the structure overlap, vertical displacements and torsion. That was fatal. It is interesting to notice that all of this could have been avoided if only the bridge had been built according to the original design in which there was a truss supporting the structure. The truss would let the bridge be more stiff and would allow the wind to just pass through it, not causing any trouble. But okay. It is not all that bad, because this tragedy really helped the development of science. After it, scientists and engineers started to research the aerodynamics of bridges and testing of models in wind tunnels became mandatory. And now in the end, I'm asking you, who won, the bridge or the wind? The wind won this battle, but the bridges, however, are winning the war. Taya, thank you. I think you and Andre should get together and form a village people tribute band. But <laughs> before you do, take some questions from the panel. <laughs> so
So now that, that this, this battle has been won and the bridges are winning the war, what else can go yeah. wrong for, with bridges? What, 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 is, what, what, what is the next big thing that could go wrong with bridges? Uh, there are many problems with bridges, for example, earthquakes or something, but researchers are starting to do some things that could uh, prevent all these bridges for, from collapsing. But uh, many bridges now are standing still and safe, so there are, mm, few, there are less problems than it were in the, in the past. I think engineers aren't celebrated enough in the world of science. I know it's something that's come up at this festival in the past and on radio yeah. and TV programming. Yeah, it, I think it is true because also I was the only only Croatian engineer in, involved in FAMLAB ever. So uh, I think many people think that engineers are not real scientists, but I can tell you that I do a lot of maths, a lot of numerical methods, so I think that uh, we, can, we can do some, some pretty nice things. Um, have you ever built a bridge? No, I haven't, but I have worked on a bridge construction site in Istanbul, and it was the Halic bridge for the metro. And it was uh, very interesting to see how, how it is built in the real world, because we are all always on our computer and in our books. We rarely, rarely see some fields on hands-on uh, uh, things, so it was, it was real nice to see how it is built just from, from, from scratch. If you've got time, if you haven't got, if you haven't got one, then we're fine. Bridges okay. abridged from our Croatian winner, Teo Rukavina. <laughs> and that was the last of our 27 semi-finalists. 27 already. Six have gone through to the final. Another three, possibly four, are about to join them. Judges, you've asked some very telling questions and some really ropey ones. Now get going, get decisive, and get back here as fast as you can. Applause, please, and heckles to speed Robin, Katie, and Roberto on their way. Right, so we've seen the stuff about neutrinos and diabetes and fusion and perceptual presumptions, female promiscuity, drug delivery, rain, theoretical and experimental synergy, and bridges. Amazing range of subjects, but whatever they decide, you also get to decide on something as well. You've seen Anastasia, Avital, Dina, Dongson, Lillian, Andra, Simon, Taya, Viet, alphabetical order again. But who do you most want to see again tomorrow doing an entirely different FameLab presentation? Uh, so this is where you put these voting pads to good use. Thank you. The house lights are already up as well. It's very simple. Nine FameLabbers, nine numbers. Just vote for whoever you think was best. I stress not favorite scientific discipline, country you'd most like to go to on holiday, uh, weirdest hairstyle, closest relative, country you happen to be from. We want to vote. Voting is completely anonymous. No one will ever know. Vote for who you actually like best. So if you're all ready, it's the last button you push. Push that button. Your time starts. You've got 15 seconds starting from now. And I'll get away from the back because I can never tell when 15 seconds is actually up. It's 15 seconds. Thank you for voting. Please do give your hands, uh, your handsets back at the end. They are of absolutely no use whatsoever in the real world. So, great video. And what's more, we have fully rematerialized Robin, Katie, and Roberto. So, come on back. <laughs> Applause, please, for our judges. No, I think you can. That's true, actually. If you, I don't know. Judges have tended to sit. But, there's, you know, you're a bit more spontaneous here as well. So, the way we're doing this, by the way, is going to do the audience vote after yours. I will, I'm going to kind of build the suspense by saying, yet again, I've been handed the envelope and had whispered in my ear, it's a tie. Now, the question is again, do you remember the rules? They get to send through three, three people, we get to send through whoever's in this envelope. It may be the same, it may be different. Obviously, mathematically, if it's a tie, the odds are in favor. So, first of all, as is traditional in these things, you have to tell us that you don't say, oh, it was really easy, actually. Three people stood out from the crowd by a mile. So what was, what was it like? Was it tough? It was tough. I mean, what was, was good was I thought there were a lot of great anecdotes. And that's one of the, the things that is wonderful to watch is to see someone taking on a story, setting something up at the beginning, and then within three minutes coming to a completion. And so we had to take in so many different things to ultimately, like the first five minutes go, no, but that also did have, no, I think we should keep them in. So there was a lot of, until the going, there's a minute left. Yeah. They went, actually, yeah, we've just got to do this now. So I felt that there was ev every single person 
presented uh, an interesting idea, lots of sticky ideas that will be with me, uh, obviously, tomorrow as well. And, and Possibly I've longer if you're very lucky. Yeah. Well, well, it depends how long I live. I'm very pessimistic. Um, but, the, uh, but yeah, I think the... Uh, so it wasn't an easy thing of just... We didn't go downstairs and just cross people off very, very quickly. They were all interesting ideas. Okay, either of you got any sort of thoughts on the, on the judging process? Just uh, one of the other things I ever done. I wanted to keep them all and, and, and put them all forward, but you know, only three survived. Yeah. Well, no, survive is perhaps putting a bit. <laughs> <laughs> Did we not? Yeah, we changed the rules. Yeah, yeah. So, yes. We didn't tell you about the death the machine. The death, the death machine outside. Uh, and Katie, again, same, same business for you, really. Uh, yeah, there were some fantastic uh, bits of language, ways of phrasing things that really stuck with me. There were some really nice stories, and just, yeah, it was a very difficult decision. Okay, well. Okay, like we say, we have to do, there's three, whichever order you do them in, it doesn't mean one is higher than the other, so let's have your three, please, however you want to break it up between you. Well, I'll, I'll start off with, uh, it was contestant number three, Don, who uh, I thought that was a very well uh, delivered and very interesting ideas about the difference between currently humanity and, uh, and robots and, and the possibilities and the limitations. So I thought Okay, Don Dong Sung Chang, come on fantastic. up. <laughs> wow. Could a robot do that? Not without a lot of programming, it couldn't. Right, okay. Um, our second finalist is Lillian from CERN. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't, don't have to do what Dong did, it's fine. Just pick a direction, any direction. She couldn't decide the theoretical way or the experimental <laughs> way. She was torn between the two there as well. Okay, so Lillian Smiesta. Congratulations. And thirdly, again, not in any kind of ranking sort of and order. And I'm looking for a yellow hard hat. There. <laughs> Brilliant. So, all I know is there's a tie. Aha. <laughs> uh -huh. It's happened again, again. Not only is it a tie, it's a tie this way. It is Dong Sion from Germany and Teo Rukavina from Croatia. You are. You get nothing extra for that. It just means the judges are for once at one with the people. It's a very unusual situation to be in. So that means, speaking very quickly as best as I can, we have our, we now know our lineup. We've been at this since 11 o'clock this morning, but we finally have, in no particular order, uh, Australia, Sandeep Kamath. Uh, hang on, I'm going to try and do it in a particular order. Australia, Sandeep Kamath. CERN, Lillian Smiesta. Cyprus, uh, Louisa Sophocleus. Uh, Croatia, Thea Rukavina. France, Francois Xavier Joly. Netherlands, Marcia Brandenburg Goddard. Switzerland, Oscar Ivinko. Germany, Dong Sun. United Kingdom, Ema Maguire. I hope that's all nine of the finalists, but they all deserve a collective round of applause. <laughs> and commiserations to our runners-up who are all brilliant as well. Now, I said that was in no particular order, but tomorrow, of course, we will need a very particular order. So, we've planned this as this triple semi-final draws to a close. We close with a draw for who goes where in the FameLab International Final tomorrow over at the EDF Energy Arena. We've got a hat, which belongs to Tim Slingsby from British Council. It's a largely non-speaking role, the hat at Vera, but we are very grateful to British Council. I'm going to get Robin. We haven't briefed you on this, Robin. It may be kind of, you know, a bit of a risk to try this. But can you draw names out of a hat? And this will be the order. You could stand up even. Yeah, if you yeah, I'll do that. Right, so, uh, uh, name number uh, one is, uh, it's CERN, it's Lillian. Lillian, you get to go first. <laughs> I hope someone's writing this down because I'm Number not. Two, uh, it's UK. It's Emma Maguire. Okay. Do you want to pass over to you now? Emma, you're second. Okay. Uh, Netherlands. Netherlands, just Netherlands. Okay. Yeah. Marcia <laughs> Brandenburg Goddard, you are number three. Go on. Too many words. Too many words. I got two. Oh, sorry. And we got Switzerland, Oscar Ivinko. Yeah, okay, Oscar Ivinko, you are fourth. You can applaud each uh, one along the way, it just uh, adds a bit of drama. Croatia, Taya is uh, going to be fifth. Taya, you are fifth, that's better. Sixth, France, Francois Javier Jolie. Very good. And the 
next one is Cyprus, Luisa Sophocles. Close enough. S uh, seven. <laughs> then Australia, uh, Sandip. Sandip, you are eight. And finally, by a process of elimination, if I'm not mistaken, the last name is? Germany. It is Germany, and it is Dong Sun Chang. <laughs> Whoa, thank you. So that really is it. Best of luck to all nine of them. Uh, remember, each will be doing a brand new presentation, different from what they've done today. Some of them, I bet, will have already thought of something. Some of them, I bet, will not. I wonder who will it be. Please, can we thank our judges again? Ro Ro Robin Ince, Roberto Trotter, Katie Steckles. <laughs> You'll get to see Katie again as our actual live interval act tomorrow. We're not doing a video. Any clues, anything you want to tell us to kind of whet our appetite? There'll be maths. There'll be maths. <laughs> what more can we do? Uh, can we please thank everybody involved in the backstage of this, everybody involved in FameLab, particularly Joe James at the Science Festival, Tim Slingsby from the British Council. Thank you to yourselves for coming along. And if you've the energy, give yourselves a big cheer if you've been here since 11 a.m. <laughs> so I am Quentin Cooper at QWERTY. This has been the longest single event in the history of Cheltenham Science Festival. And it should mean we're in for a fantastic international final, EDF Energy Arena, tomorrow at 8.30. Um, uh, if by any chance you haven't had enough of me today, by the way, which seems unlikely, then listen to Radio 4 tonight at 9pm for my documentary, The Mother of the Sea, about why a British woman who never visited Japan is still revered there, and not just as a scientific heroine, but as a goddess. 9pm, Radio 4. Please do listen. Congratulations one more time to not just our winners, but to all 27 of our Fame Labulous Fame Labbers. And see you tomorrow.